So say you took the traditional high volume approach or the tr traditional stupid power lifting, bodybuilding bullshit approach. If you're not using a high intensity training approach, you are approaching exercise wrong. There is no good reason, first of all, to move quickly during an exercise. I'm doing my morning cardio this morning, chipping away three miles per hour at a level 10 grade like I do every morning. And I made the mistake of trying to make time go by faster by turning on YouTube. So it should have been an informative run of lifting videos to help get my day started, get the creative juices flowing, ended up turning into a 30 minute rage walking session. I mean, I was clenching my fists. I was throwing my elbows like the old ladies that do power walking at like 4 a.m. around your neighborhood. My blood pressure has been up today. Greg Doucette covered a topic today that has persisted for as long as I've been lifting. It seems to pop back up generationally. It will not go away. And that is the one set to failure claim. Coach Greg and one set is all you need. And so when you go to the gym, you should only be doing one set. If you do more, well, it's not good. And so Tom Kayat presented the evidence as to why this is true. I'm talking about the working set that's gonna provide the stimulus for growth. One proper set until failure and then back off. Years ago, I consulted the man himself, six time Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates. One set per exercise took him to the pinnacle of bodybuilding. The high intensity training crowd that worships Mike Menser and Dorian Yates and claims that not only is training one set to failure on each exercise a viable way to train, it's not just saying that it might be a preference that you're going to have when you realize the trade offs that it has with it over the way you're training now. No, the claim is that it is the best way to train for everybody in every circumstance and you are stupid if you don't do it. If you're not using a high intensity training approach, you are approaching exercise wrong. So this has been around since the 70s. It's associated with Arthur Jones and Mike Menser who are thought of as the pioneers of it. And of course, Dorian Yates is the one that gets cited because he had the most success. He was a game changer in bodybuilding. He had a freakish physique won a bunch of Mr. Olympias, and he was known for training like an absolute madman. Any one of you can go and watch his blood and guts footage on YouTube for free. Six times Mr. Olympia champion who did one set per exercise. But did you see how hard he did that one set? He did that one set so hard that 99% of the population could not train that hard. Go to failure, beyond failure, drop set, failure again, drop it again, all out. Now, there's no doubt that the way Dorian trained worked for him, but there's a lot of things to cover with that. This is a problem we run into when we look at the absolute best of all time and try to pull training information from them. And it's the reason that you don't just by default look to the best person. Because while it makes sense that the best performers are the ones that you have the most to learn from, there are also other reasons why they're the best performers. And it might involve circumstances that are fundamentally different from where you are, which means there's there's things you can't get away with or there's things you have to do that they didn't. And you don't really know that until you get in and start doing the work. But as far as Dorian's concerned, we know he was a genetic outlier. We know that he had a PED regiment. We know that he lived and ate and trained and slept like a monk. He has all of these factors going into who he is. And on top of that, the dude trained with just monstrous intensity. And I covered in a previous video, the whole training to failure discussion, whether or not you should do it even in the context of volume, because all of the studies around it are hard to interpret because there isn't even a definition as to what training to failure is. And we're going to see that in a minute to Dorian. It wasn't training to failure. It was training to the absolute limit, doing four reps, controlled negatives, drop sets. You're talking about a single set lasting a long period of time. So it's not just one set to failure. There's a whole bunch of other shit that goes into it. And that's where the, the stress came in. That's where that continued adaptive response came from. So like I said, it's a viable way to train, but you have to weigh the trade-offs. The thing is for the people that claim this is the only way you should be training, this has been around long enough for it to have gotten picked up if it was the better way to train. If you can actually get world-class levels of strength and size and conditioning in 45 minutes a day, three or four days a week, 
everybody would be doing that. Dorian even talked in a video about how he thought he had an edge over the other guys because he was only training 45 minutes to their two and a half, three hour sessions. That is a direct competitive edge in any sport you would possibly compete in. So if it did give those results to everybody, why isn't anybody doing it? Now, remember, like I said, the supporters of high intensity training, they don't just assert that it's viable or that it might be preferable. They assert that it outright is the absolute best way to train it. And anybody who doesn't has been lied to or is a moron and so on. The degree of cultish behavior around the disciples of high intensity training cannot be overstated. I mean, they're just off the chart, both in how exuberant they are and proclaiming that this is like the one true method of training, but also in the complete lack of reason for any of them to actually believe that this is the case. It's like flat earth shit in that way. It's like, not only is there like lack of evidence supporting it, but there's actually no reason to believe that what you're saying is true. So here we have Jay Vincent. I only know who he is because he popped up on an Elliot Hulse video. And so far I'm not really impressed. It's clear that he's going hard to the paint using these types of branding tactics to establish himself as an authority. Why wouldn't you choose an exercise protocol which saves you time? High intensity training principles are rooted in peer reviewed scientific literature. If you're not using a high intensity training approach, you are approaching exercise wrong. The more aggressively you commit to one point, and the more you drive it home over and over, the more people tend to defer expertise to you. It's like, well, this person is so certain. They have such conviction. It must be grounded in some truth. This person must know what they're talking about. It's also the same when you're being contrarian. So when there's a, a narrative out there that's widely accepted, it doesn't matter how foundationally true it is. It doesn't matter how obviously self-evident it is. If you have an individual who rails against the status quo, there's a certain type of clout that comes with that. There's a certain type of, I don't know, charisma or influence that comes from it. And that is attractive to people. And we can see that in politics. We can see that in social discussions, but being very, very certain and very contrarian is a cheap, dirty, easy way to get people in your camp. Even if you have absolutely no basis for the shit that you're saying. In fact, especially if you have no basis for it. So most of his stuff involves doubling down on high intensity being the one true method. And a lot of it is him just picking popular figures who are pretty well respected and then just grilling them, outright calling them morons. He had a bit on knees over toes guy. Uh, so I'm not impressed. I mean, it's pretty clear what he's trying to do. And there's no doubt that it works for him to some degree. From a pure shameless marketing perspective, it makes sense. But if you're trying to get to a good, solid understanding of how this shit works and fits together, this guy hits one note and uh, it's a dumb note. So he gives three reasons why high intensity training isn't just viable, but why it's the absolute best way to train. So by combining everything into one prolonged set, we're making it more efficient, we're making it safer, and with the continuous muscular loading without taking pointless breaks in between sets, we're making it more effective. He says because it saves time, it's safer, and it's more effective. Now you can't really argue with the save time thing. Of course, one set is going to take less time than multiple working sets. But the thing is saving time isn't always a priority. For instance, I've talked about the 80, 20 rule, which a lot of self-help books and productivity books will talk about. People tend to worry about small shit when 80% of your returns come from 20% of these few things that you do well. So you focus on those things and you're going to get a, a bigger overall return. That's fine for most people, but if you're trying to become the best, you actually need to sacrifice that 80% of time that only gives a 20% of return because you need that 20% of return in order to edge out the competition. So those trying to be the best don't have the luxury of finding the most time efficient way because that's always going to involve a less overall return. And like I said earlier, if this actually was as productive as was claimed while saving all this time, everybody would be doing it. So I can't take the save time claim seriously because to those trying to actually be the best or trying to get to some limit, saving time is not a priority. If saving time is a priority for you, that's fine. That just means you're a recreational lifter. But for those that are going hard to try to get every ounce of performance that they can, I mean, this is how you end up with Olympic athletes who train eight or 10 hours a day. That's a thing. This is how you end up with Olympic lifting teams that do two-a-days, six, seven days a week. 
we've had the state sponsored programs. We've had the massive pools of talent trained in all kinds of different ways to find out what works the best. Nobody has come to the conclusion that limited training is the way to edge out the competition. As far as it being safer, this is an interesting one. I mean, I guess it's intuitive that if you're using very light loads and moving very slow, the way that he suggests you train, that you're not as likely to get injured as if you're using heavy loads moving very fast. That's intuitive. That makes some sense. Now, he made some comment about powerlifting and bodybuilding bullshit. So say you took the traditional high volume approach or the tr traditional stupid powerlifting bodybuilding bullshit approach and you saw substantial gains within three to six months using these fast repetition cadences which generate high peak forces. Month six, you hurt your rotator cuff or your pec. Now you're out for six to eight months. So all that time spent generating and improving your physical capacity gone like that. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he isn't advocating this as being a superior strength training methodology. I don't think he's that daft, but he did mention power lifting bullshit when he was. So he's critical of that style of training, even for strength. Now there is no universe where you develop your peak levels of strength without addressing neurological adaptations. You cannot get those adaptations by moving a submaximal weight very slow until failure and then stopping. You have to practice moving explosively. You have to practice rate of force development. That is the only way that you condition maximal force production is under heavier loads. It has to pop up in your training eventually. If you're worried about injury, that means you have to temper yourself to it. You have to know how to train that way. You have to know what weights to pick. You have to know when you're in the pocket. You have to know when you're not, and maybe you should bail or give up on the rep. There's a lot that goes into it, and you're not better off for ignoring that style of training. Also, if you want to look at Dorian, Dorian had injuries throughout his career. And also, if you want to look at Dorian, Dorian didn't train the way that Jay is advocating for it. He didn't do proper technique with slow movements. He had nasty, aggressive heaving movements where he was trying to squeeze every single ounce out of the movement. So even what Jay's talking about, it's not even in the same galaxy as what Dorian did. And this is a problem that got brought up in the training to failure video that I did some time ago. The big problem with evaluating it from an evidence-based standpoint is there is absolutely no established goalpost as to what the hell that means. You can look at Dorian Yates training to failure and compare that to someone like Jay Cutler, who is known for using more volume. Look at how Jay Cutler trains. He goes until the rep starts to slow down to where he's approaching failure. Then he gets hands on the bar. Somebody assists him and he does more. So he is going beyond the amount of work in a single set that he would be able to do if he was just doing straight weight by himself without assistance. That has to count as a, a form of going beyond failure. It's not clearly defined. There's no way of separating it. Jay stopping right when the bar slows down and you can't move anymore and then lowering under control, that's training to failure, but so is what Dorian is doing. At some point, you have to compare apples to apples and this ain't it. Now, as far as his claim that it's more effective, that's something that he repeats over and over using that vague salesman jargon where he doesn't have to commit to an actual instance where it's better. You have the same couple of people. I talked to Dory and I talked to Mike Mentzer. I learned from the greats. These people are outliers. There's a reason that those are the two names that everybody knows. It's because it's easy to remember because nobody else does it. So I don't know what other discipline you would look at uh, two people that had success with a methodology in an entire sea where literally nobody else has. It, it defies reason. The only reason you would do it is because there is some other incentive for you to go against the grain, for you to be contrarian. This is just as much about personal branding, either for social status or because you have a vested interest in being different than everybody else. Likely it's for a business reason, for advertising, for marketing, because being different is how you stand out. It is very hard to get people to listen to you when you're saying things that are just foundationally true. You have to have some angle. You have to have an interesting or different way of packaging that information, but that takes intelligence and expertise and time and attention. And not everybody wants to deal with that bullshit. So it's easy just to take one little thing that has a nugget of truth and stretch it out until it's its own self-sustaining ideology, regardless of how dumb the conclusions you come to are. Now, one of the things that stands out is Jay telling Elliot that the people that do volume are on gear. Now you got a lot of bodybuilders in the gym 
for each volume, but there's a problem with that. Most of these bodybuilders are drug enhanced and most of them can tolerate that level of volume. Like, okay, first of all, everybody's on gear. It's not like one camp of this training ideology is on gear and everybody else isn't. You have a ton of people on gear that have no business being on gear, novices, recreational trainees, everybody at the higher levels of competition is on gear. So the idea that it somehow puts a nail in the coffin because, well, the only reason those guys can train that way is because they're on gear is absolutely silly. And I mentioned before that the funny thing with gear, people can't really decide. Is it that it allows you to get away with more work so you can end up doing these massive amounts of work that wouldn't otherwise be sustainable? Or is it actually that it allows you to get more out of a smaller training dose? So the guys on gear can actually get kind of lazy and they can just get really, really good by doing a little bit of training and then letting the drugs do the rest. They, they can't really figure that out. But there is no doubt that Dorian's genetics paired with the amount of gear that he was on contributed to him getting a massive response from smaller doses of training. That's absolutely a thing. The wisdom usually goes, and this is from people that have spent their entire life working with different trainees. The wisdom usually goes that slow gainers and natural athletes, those who do not have a predisposition to grow very fast from a certain training stimulus, that they need to do more work in order to reach their potential. It's like Josh Bryant says, the slow kid in class has to study twice as much. Genetics and pharmaceuticals contribute hugely to somebody getting a certain response from a dose of training. And if you don't have those circumstances that predispose you to that, you're going to need more work. The solution is going to be more doses of training. Now, after saying all that, this is the big problem, the main problem I have with this. And this is what makes my blood boil. Long-term success requires understanding all of the variables that go into training. There's a lot of sources you can look at. If you're a masochist, you can go sift through textbooks or you can go look through decades worth of training journals, muscle magazines, or you can get something like Mike Isratel's scientific principles of strength training that breaks it all down in a very uh, clear and concise way. These are all dials that you can turn. Turning a dial gets a specific result and they all represent a different type of stress, but all of those stresses are still conducive to gaining strength and gaining size. Now we know that doing the same thing over and over eventually gets stagnant. So we engage in progressive overload. That's why we don't do the same exact workout. Your first week at a construction job, if you were sedentary, you're gonna be sore, you're gonna be hurting. Eventually you get stronger, eventually you get conditioned and it's another day in the office. But six years down the line, you're not stronger than after that first six months. Six years down the line, you're just as equipped to handle the job. Your body finds homeostasis. If you want to continue progressing those qualities, the amount of work you handle has to increase. Progressive overload has to, has to be factored in. But even progressive overload, just adding more weight, putting your head down and trying to apply more effort, even that runs out of steam eventually. And that's where you have to start looking at manipulating other training variables. If you do high intensity for months on end, eventually it gets stale. One of the easiest, most proven ways to change how you respond is to turn one of those dials. Okay, I've been doing low volume. If I start to add more volume, I'm going to respond. Volume, the total number of lifts, all of this shit that has nothing to do with training to failure, they are still anabolic triggers. If they weren't, powerlifting training would be wildly different than it is. Olympic lifting training would be wildly different than it is. So they talk in such absolute terms, like the only thing that causes muscle growth is the fatigue you get at the end of a hard set. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And the way that they talk, they look at a study, they over extrapolate conclusions from it. And then they put that on a fixed point and move everything around it. Like this is the thing that never changes. And that's such a dumb one dimensional way of looking at things because no matter how optimal you think something is because you pulled it out of a study, it's not going to be just as optimal in every member of a population. And it's not going to be just as optimal in one individual over their entire training lifetime. Variables have to change. We're adaptive organisms. As we do one thing, it stops being as effective. It stops being as optimal. It's like when Ben Yang spams his Instagram with all of the optimal exercise selections because he has a degree and understands physiology and, and movement mechanics. So, if he were to sit here and say, well, this is the optimal movement. This is all you should be doing. Like, really? You're not going to weigh trade-offs. There isn't a point where it'd be optimal to do something else. That is one dimensional thinking. And we need to be playing 3d chess. Also, I'm the last one to cite anything evidence-based, but the evidence for volume is like extremely clear. No matter how many times you run these studies, they find that doing more work up to a certain point tends to provide better results. 
The research, the literature, it's very clear. And in the real world, most people, the vast majority, 99% plus, are going to make more gains if they're an intermediate or advanced lifter from doing more than one set. And so the first set, well, that gives you the best bang for your buck. If you go in the gym, you don't have a lot of time, and you do one set, you can make 50% of the gains from just doing that one single set. If you go all out to failure, about five sets done twice a week seems to be the maximum amount of gains that you can get. So Jay can cite the studies as much as he wants. The evidence is like extraordinarily clear on this and it's consistent with what everybody experiences out in the field. So anyways, the insistence that you can look at a couple of studies established that one approach is better and then deduce that it's better for everyone in all circumstances at any given point in time is retarded. And you have to be an unreasonable zealot or a shameless charlatan to try to push that narrative to the masses on a regular basis. High intensity training, I'm sure, is a perfectly viable way to add mass, especially in certain members of the population, but it's been around for over 50 years, which is plenty of time for it to catch fire, and it hasn't. So why doesn't anybody do it? I could go on and on, guys, but I'm hoarse from raging. So leave what you think in the comments. Don't forget to check out Patreon if you want daily updates of my training, if you want access to me, questions, not just for me, but for the people I interview. I have some big interviews coming up. Go ahead and check out Patreon. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.